Hello, today we're going to be looking at how we can take this um, knowledge we have about factoring expressions and start solving equations. If we look back to the questions that we had in the previous night's homework, all of these were expressions, right? There's no equal sign that's there. And what we do is we factor and stop. Today we're going to look to see what happens when we have equations and what we can do instead. But first I want to remind you guys of the zero product property, okay? In, the, in words, the zero product property says that if the product, that's when you multiply, when the product of two expressions is zero, then that means either one or both of those expressions equal zero, okay? So ultimately, that's what that means. Algebraically, let's say that A is an expression and B is an expression. If those are expressions and A times B equals zero, then whatever A is has to equal zero or whatever B is has to equal zero or both. So here's an example of that. Let's say that I have that X plus five times the quantity X plus two equals zero. We have a product, this is multiplication, and it's equal to zero. Well, then that means that this expression, x plus five, could equal zero, or that this expression, x minus two, could equal zero. And then we can use that idea to solve each one, okay? So eventually what you could say is you could say, okay, I can subtract five. So X is negative five, add two to both sides here, or X is two, okay? So ultimately that ends up being your final answer to that, but that's because of the use of the zero product property. So how could we find this, um, how could we use this property to find the root of an equation? Well, again, one of the things is that when we find the roots of an equation, the roots of an equation are the same as the solutions. So those words are synonymous, okay? So if we see roots, those are the same as solutions. And so what we can do is to use the zero product property, we have to make sure that we have something equal to zero. There isn't like a one product property or a negative 10 product property. It's the zero product property. So what we'll do is we'll set one side equal to zero, okay? We've got the zero part. Now we need the product part. And to have a product means that we need multiplication. And that's where we factor. Remember that when we factor, we're turning a problem into a multiplication problem, into things that have, uh, that we would see, where we would see a product. And then what you would do is you would use the zero product property. Okay, so I'll call the zero product property here the ZPP, all right? Um, so we'll use the zero product property by setting both of those factors equal to zero and solving. So this will be an awesome way for us to practice factoring, but then also be able to solve. So again, this says to find the roots of each equation by factoring. Well, in letter A, we have x squared minus 2x minus 15 equals zero. Yay, it equals zero. So that means that we can move on to step two, which is to factor. There's no GCF, so I'm going to set up my double bubble. I know to make x squared, I can use x and x. And this is nice. This is a leading coefficient of 1. So I just think, what are some things that multiply to negative 15 but add to negative 2? And hopefully you guys came up with negative 5 and 3. So that's the, the um, second thing we would do is to factor. One side was equal to 0. Now we factor. Now we'll use the zero product property. And because this is the first time we're doing it together, what we're really doing is we're thinking about setting each of these factors equal to zero and solving. So x minus five could equal zero, or this x plus three could equal zero. And then you just solve each of those. We could add five to both sides to get x equals five subtract three from both sides to get x equals negative three, and those are our possible solutions, x equals five or x equals negative three. 
let's do the same thing with B. We would not start letter B by factoring because we don't have one side equal to zero. So I would subtract so that one side was equal to zero, and then I can solve. There is no GCF, so I'm going to try to use my double bubble. Now to make 2x squared, I can't just use x and x, right? So to make 2x squared, I could use 2x and x. And then I'm going to think about numbers that multiply to make 21. And I'm going to um, try to make it so that my outer and inner give us this negative 1x that's here. So when I think about things that multiply to, 20, to negative 21, again, I always usually start with the inside factors, so not 1 and 21, but I think of 3 and 7. If I put a 7 here, I'm going to be multiplying that by 2. That makes 14. That's a little big. But if I put a 3 here, that makes a 6. And if I put a 7 here, that makes a 7. So notice that I can think about this 6x and 7x. And if I make the 7x negative and the 6x positive, I end up with negative 1x. So that factors as 2x minus 7 times the quantity x plus 3. And then we have that equal to 0. And because it's an equation equal to 0, then I can use the zero product property. I can think about setting 2x plus 7. Oh, just kidding. 2x minus 7 equal to 0 or x plus 3 equals 0, okay? So leave the factors alone. Don't change their sign. <laughs> so 2x minus 7 equals 0, or x plus 3 equals 0. And how would we solve this? I would start by adding 7 and dividing by 2. So x is 7 over 2. Now I can subtract 3, and I get that x is negative 3. And those would be my two solutions, okay? In letter C, I have 16x squared minus 25 equals 0. Well, it's equal to 0, so I can start by factoring. There's no GCF. Um, and I noticed that these look pretty special. Both of these are perfect squares. So since both of these are perfect squares, I can think about the square root of each one. This is the same as 4x being squared, and this is the same as 5 being squared. And so that means because this is this dots pattern, this difference of two squares, I'm going to have a double bubble with those um, square roots inside. And then do you remember how we have to factor those? In order to get the negative 25 and for the outer inner to cancel, one of them is going to be adding them, the two square, uh, square roots, and one is going to be subtracting them, okay? Then we would think about setting each of these equal to zero and solving. Now, some of you guys can do that in your head, and that's fine. But if we're getting incorrect answers, I, I really want you to show all the steps. So here I would start by subtracting 5 and dividing by 4. Here, I would add 5 and divide by 4. So I end up with these two solutions. Now, in the grand scheme of things, of course, ideally, you would want to substitute the values in and check um, to make sure that your solutions are correct. Um, but again, um, this is the process that we'll use. I'm going to do your turn number three with um, together before we, I um, ask you guys to do the next three on your own. Um, because this one, again, we want to start by getting one side equal to zero. And sometimes you have to move several things over. Here we would have to subtract 2z and subtract 30. Okay, so I end up with z squared minus 5z minus 36 equals 0. So sometimes you have several things to move to the other side. That's okay. I just get everything equal to 0. There's no GCF, so I'm going to make my double bubble. And this is a leading coefficient of 1, so I can use z and z. 
And I think about things that multiply to negative 36, um, that could give me 5. So 6 and 6 won't work. Um, 18 and 2 won't work. Um, 12 and 3 won't work. What about 9 and 4? If I did minus 9 plus 4, that seems to work. And again, technically we should set each one equal to 0. But if you see, I can set z minus 9 equal to 0, and I get z equals 9. And I set z plus 4 equal to 0, and I get z equals negative 4, then that's fine. Okay? So those would be your solutions. So don't cheat. Pause the video for a few minutes and see if you can work through numbers 4 through 6. And then um, when you are set with that, unpause and you can check your answers. Okay? Hello again. Let's see how you guys did. In number four, hopefully you started by subtracting three to get one side equal to zero. I then was able to factor as uh, the quantity two X plus one times the quantity X minus three equals zero to get these solutions. One thing that sometimes um, students will do is they'll totally disregard this um, coefficient in front and they'll say, oh, this means X equals, all I do is just change the sign as X equals negative one. No, 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 no. You've got to make sure that you compensate for this as well. You would have to subtract 1 and divide by 2 to get that x equals negative 1 half. I do want to point out in number 5 that this was a PST. This was a perfect square trinomial. These, this was 2x squared on the one end and 1 squared on the other end. And if I multiply and double, I get that middle term of 4x. So I didn't make a double bubble of 2x plus 1 and 2x plus 1. I used the perfect square trinomial pattern. And in that case, notice that um, even if it's squared, we still just set 2x plus 1 equal to 0, and I get that x is negative 1 half. Number 6 was a dots pattern, and so I ended up with negative 11 thirds or 11 thirds. If you write um, as your answer x equals plus or minus 11 thirds for this problem, this is okay because those were your answers, positive 11 thirds and negative 11 thirds. Notice that's not the same for all of these problems, but what you'll find is that that's true when we have those difference of two squares. Okay? All right. So we talked about this um, in a little um, a, up there a little bit that when we discuss solutions to a quadratic equation, they can also be referred to as roots. Okay, so asking for solutions and roots are that they're asking the same thing, and so those are also um, the zeros. and they correspond to the x-intercepts of the corresponding quadratic function. By corresponding quadratic function, what I mean by that is that instead of being equal to zero, there's an output variable y there that's instead. Now, one thing about the notation of these things, when we have roots and solutions, these are always written as x equals something. Roots are written as x equals something. Zeros are also written as x equals something. But x-intercepts are technically ordered pairs, and we can steal the x value as the x-coordinate, but then we make sure to imply that the y-coordinate would be 0 if those are being graphed. Okay. So solutions, roots, and zeros, we always have x equals something. X-intercepts will be an ordered pair. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like us to start looking at some functions, which means that instead of being equal to zero, we have it equal to y. And this says to rewrite the equation in intercept form and find the zeros. Well, remember intercept form was when we had um, I'll write it over here. Intercept form, remember, of a quadratic is when we had y equals a times x minus p times x minus q. Essentially, this is factored, right? Intercept form 
is really factored form. So what we can do is we, when it says to rewrite the equation in intercept form, that really means to factor. So let's try to do that here. Let's try to factor y equals x squared plus 5x minus 6. Well, there's no GCF, so I could then just try to make a double bubble. And I could use x and x. And I need to, to come up with things that multiply to negative 6 but add to positive 5. So some people say, oh, well, plus 3 and plus 2. Well, that doesn't give me negative 6, though, right? So always be cautious of your signs. If I use plus 6 and minus 1, that should work. And so this is that rewritten in intercept form. So how cool is that? Now that we can factor, we're able to write some of these quadratic functions that are in standard form now into intercept form. And let's think back to intercept form. Do you remember how we found the x-intercepts of the function? Okay. Um, what we did is to find the x-intercepts is we took the opposite of what was here. So as an x-intercept, this would have been at negative 6, 0. And this would have been at 1, 0. Right? And notice that if we were to graph this, the graph does pass through 1, 2, 3, 4 negative 6, 0, and 1, 0, correct? And when it asks us to find the zeros of the function, what it's asking you to do is replace this y value with 0. It's saying replace that with 0 and then find where the x values are going to be 0. And if we think about our use of the zero product property, we would set x plus 6 equal to 0 to get that x equals negative 6. We could set x minus 1 equal to 0 to get that x equals 1. And these would be the zeros of the function. Okay. So I just want us to make sure that we're looking at that um, correlation that, that um, um, the relationship between the zeros and the x-intercepts of a function, okay? And again, a way that you could check your work if you had a graphing calculator is to graph the function and to look to see where the x-intercepts are because the x-intercepts will occur at the zeros of the function, okay? So just a little connection there. So let's look at this example. This says to find the zeros of the function by rewriting the function in intercept form. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we know that intercept form, we said that this intercept form is going to be like factored form. Okay. And what's the first thing that we look at when we factor? We look for a GCF. Does example three have a greatest common factor? Oh, yay, it does. Okay. I can pull a 2 out. So if I pull a 2 out, I end up with x squared plus 2x minus 15. Okay? Now I want to continue factoring that. So um, I'll make a double bubble. And I have x and x. And, oh, this is a nice one. Plus 5 and minus 3. Okay. And again, if it wants the function in intercept form, make sure I have that f of x equals. Okay. So this is what the function looks like in intercept form. Now what it asks us to do is to find the zeros of the function. So by finding the zeros of the function, we're really setting f of x equal to 0, and we're seeing what our solutions would be, okay? You guys, this 2 doesn't have a variable with it, 
it has no bearing on the x-intercepts whatsoever. We only look at factors involving x. So one of our factors involving x is x plus 5. And if I think about setting that equal to 0, I would have to subtract 5, and I'd get x is negative 5. Another factor that involves x is x minus 3. If I set that equal to 0, that would be x equals 3. Okay, And those, again, are the zeros of the function. Okay, You can think back to what we did in intercept form and think about how you could feasibly check that. If this was in intercept form, think about where your x-intercepts would be. Your x-intercepts would be at negative 5, 0, and 3, 0. And notice that those correspond to those zeros. Okay, so just make that connection. Another way that that question can be worded is this way. To find the values of x that make f of x equal to 0. And that's really what we did here, right? Zeros are values of x that make the function equal to 0. So I'd like you to do what we did in example 3 and try that in this your turn question. So take a second and pause the video and see what you can do for your turn 7. Okay, let's see how you did. I ended up getting zeros at x equals 6 and x equals 2. I started by finding my GCF. And I find it very um, helpful to write a function in intercept form because that's factored form. Then I set equal to 0, f of x equal to 0, and I find that these would be the values that make um, the function equal to 0 if f was 6 or if x was 2. And again, um, if I think about the x-intercepts, my x-intercepts would have been at 6, 0, and 2, 0, and those correspond to the zeros of the function. Okay. Now, now that we're getting into equations, we can have some. Okay, sorry about that. There's a little glitch. It, it told me I was out of space. So hopefully we saw this. Um, that was up here. So we're going to do some story problems now that we have these equations. So um, example four says that we have a rectangular vegetable garden in your backyard that measures 15 feet by 10 feet. And you want to double the area of the garden by adding the same distance x to the length and width of the garden. Find the value of x and the new dimensions of the garden. So let's think about this. We have um, a rectangular garden that measures 15 feet by 10 feet. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to double the area of the garden by adding the same distance x to the length and width of the garden. So that means that if I add a certain distance to the 10, I'm also adding that distance to the 15. Now, I don't know what that distance is. I'm going to call this x feet. So if I add x feet on one side, that means I need to add x feet to that other dimension as well. And so then what happens if I add x feet to both sides, now I'm going to have a larger rectangle, right? So that's the idea of the setup of that problem, okay? Let's think about what our original area was. Our original area um, was 10 by 15. Okay? We know that to find the area of a rectangle, we can multiply. And that gives me 150 square feet. Okay. Now, what it says it wants us to do is it says it wants us to double the area of the garden. So the doubled area then would be twice that, which would be 300 square feet. So now we know that we want our, um, 
now we know um, that we're doing the, um, that the new area is going to be 300 square feet. Well, let's think about what this means in the grand scheme of this question, okay? If I'm looking at our dimensions, let's think about what this, well, we started with 15, right? And now we are adding X to it. So this new dimension, so my new rectangle, my new garden, has a side of 15 plus X on it, okay? And then what's this side? This side would be 10 plus X. So my new rectangle would have an area of 15 plus X and 10 plus X. And now I want that new area to be 300 square feet. And ultimately, what I want to do is solve this equation. So once you have it like this, we're going to go back and um, find the steps, use the steps that we did before. What we can do is we can set one side equal to zero factor and use the zero product property. Now, to get one side equal to zero, I would subtract 300. But do you see how this is factored already? Now, just because it's factor, don't get too excited because we can only use the zero product property if it's equal to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to flesh this out a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to actually distribute. Because it's not equal to zero, let's actually distribute. So 15 times 10 is 150. If I look at my outer, that's 15x. My inner is 10x, so that's a total of 25x. And then x times x is x squared. So I have that that equals 300. Now this looks kind of more like what we had in the front. So what I can do is I can um, subtract 300. And when I do that, I'm going to write it in like that standard form. Remember, standard form starts with x squared and then x and then um, goes from there, okay? So I'm going to rewrite this as x squared plus 25x, but I'm also going to subtract this 300, and 150 minus 300 gives me negative 150. And so I've now set it equal to zero. The next thing I want to do is try to factor. There's not a greatest common factor, so I can try to set up my double bubble. And I can use x and x. And we want to think about things that multiply to 150, negative 150, that give me 25. Now, a real common thing to say is, oh, 10 times 15. The issue is that we want this to be a positive 25 but multiply to a negative 150. See how the 10 and 15 won't work? Shoot. All right, well, 150, um, oh, let's see. Maybe like if 10 and 15 work, maybe instead of 15, I could use 30. So what if I used 30 and 30 goes into 150 five times? Oh, that's looking like I can get the 25. Yep. So I'm going to use 30 and 5. I would need to say plus 30 and minus 5. That gives me an outer negative 5x, an inner negative 30x of a combined 25x. And the positive 30 times negative 5 is negative 150. Now I can use the zero product property since I have a product equal to zero. And I have that x is negative 30. And here, x is negative 5. So those are my possible values for x. Now, let's think about what x was representing. x was representing how much we're adding to the garden. Do both of these values for x make sense in the context of our situation? No. We can't add a negative 30 feet. So this doesn't make sense in context. So the only value that we're going to think about using is this x equals 5. So that's our value of x. And now let's think about what the dimensions of our garden would be. 
So our new dimensions, because it also asks us for that, would be these guys here. That was our new length and width. So we have 15 plus x and 10 plus x. And our x this time was 5. So 15 plus 5 is 20, and 10 plus 5 is 15. So my new dimensions are 20 feet by 15 feet. And those are my new dimensions. So I would use x equals 5, and then these are those new dimensions. And what would happen if I multiplied these new dimensions together? We should get that area of 300, okay? So here's one that's actually a little simpler in your turn number eight. It says to find the value of x if the area of the rectangle equals 16, okay? Not as complicated as the other one. This is basically just saying here's two dimensions, here's your area. See if you can find the value of x for your turn number eight. So go ahead, so do that. Okay, let's see how we did here. Hopefully, you just multiplied the two dimensions together to make 16. So again, it's not equal to zero, so we should distribute and then um, get one side equal to zero. I then was able to factor and I got that x is negative 8 thirds or x equals 2. Do both of these make sense? Well, if I put negative 8 thirds in, that would give us a negative dimension. So that doesn't work. If I put 2 in, we end up with dimensions that are feasible. We'd end up with 2 and 8. So our value of x would be x equals 2. And again, if it did want the new dimensions, or I shouldn't say the new dimensions, if it wanted the dimensions, um, our x would be 2, and then 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8. And I, there, wasn't, um, there weren't units given, so it would just be 2 units by 8 units there, okay? Um, example 5 is not really, is, this is just kind of for a little bit of a review, okay? Um, so this isn't really part of the solving lesson. I just want to kind of approach this a different way, okay? Um, so I mean, we, we are solving, okay, we are solving. It's just, we've talked about this. This is another way to do this kind of a problem. It's our friend, the revenue question. This says an internet provider, um, sells internet service for $30 per month to uh, 1,500 customers. For each dollar increase in price, the number of customers decreases by $25. So how much should the company charge in order to maximize the revenue? Well, let's take a look here. Remember that we know that our revenue is our price times our quantity, right? our price per unit, I should say, times our quantity. So let's look at what we have for right now, okay? My price to start was $30 per month. And my quantity to start was 1,500 customers, okay? Now, how are we changing that? We're going to increase the price by a dollar. So we're going to say plus one, but we could do that several times. So plus one X. As that happens, the number of customers decreases by 25. So we're going to decrease by 25 X times. Okay. Now the way that we attacked this before is that we put this in our calculator and we found our maximum, right? Now, the issue that some of y'all were having is you were like struggling getting the window. And although I think um, working through the idea of getting the right window, thinking about what values would make sense in the context based on what you're given is important, 
um, I want you to notice that we can use the zeros of a function to help us, okay? Remember that when we had intercept form, when we found the two zeros of the function, when we found the two x-intercepts, wasn't the vertex like right in the middle of those? So what we could do is we could find the zeros, then find the middle between the two zeros, and that can help us find our vertex. So if we find the zeros of the function, again, we're going to pretend that this is zero here. I know we don't want a revenue with zero. We're pretending, okay? And so what I can do is I can take this 30 plus 1x, and I can set that equal to zero. And I can solve. If I do that, I get that x is negative 30. I can take the 1,500 minus 25x and set that equal to zero. And then I can solve that equation. I would have to subtract the 1,500, or you could add the 25x to the other side. And then when we divide, we would get that x equals 60. Now again, these are zeros, but remember that our maximum um, revenue is going to happen at our vertex, and our vertex happens right in the middle of our zeros. So let's try to find where that would be. So our for our vertex, our x is going to be the middle here. So let's find the middle of these zeros, because that would be like two x-intercepts of negative 30, 0, and 60, 0. So let's find the middle of the zeros. and I find that our x value should be 15. Now, this is asking us how much should the company charge? How much should the company charge is like our price. So let's think about what we said about our price. Our price was 30 plus 1x. And now we know that the x value that we're going to use is 15. So 30 plus 1 times 15 is 45. So this tells us that we should charge $45. We could also find out the quantity. We could put 15 in here and find out what the quantity was as well. So we could take 1,500 um, minus 25 times 15, and we'd find that we would sell 1,125 units, okay? But it is in letter B now asking us for the maximum monthly revenue. And so what we're going to do to find the revenue is we're going to um, put x equals 15 into the whole equation. So our revenue is going to be 30 plus 1 times 15, and then 1,500 minus 25 times 15. Now remember, we already found that the price was $45. And I did mention that if we took this, this ends up being 1,125 units, and we would multiply those together to get that this would be $50,625, okay? And that would be our revenue. So remember when we were graphing these, what happened is, is that we needed to um, take a look at the, oh, where'd my calculator go? Um, what we would do is we would put this into the y equals, um, as um, 30 plus x and 1500 minus 25x and then we would have to adjust our window so my window here i might say uh, i don't know let's try 0 to 20 and then my y min um well this would be 4500 to start with so um for 45,000 to start with so I might 
try 50,000 to start and then maybe go by 1,000s and then we graph and then look, I don't see my vertex here, right? So then we'd have to play with our window a little bit more. Maybe let's go to 40, maybe let's go to 60,000. Let's see if that works. Maybe we don't like that. We'd still have to adjust. So like we can still get this answer um, in our calculator um, by finding these values, um, just like we did before. But notice that when you're dealing with the calculator, you kind of have like a lot of different stuff that you would need to deal with um, and a lot to think about. And notice that we get this um, x equals 15, which we were able to get um, without the graphing calculator, and that y was 50,625. Again, we were able to get that without the calculator. So this type of a question would be on a calculator um, um, on a calculator portion, but notice that it was kind of a pain to use the calculator because there's all this stuff that we have to do when um, it's so nice and beautiful to find this algebraically as well, okay? Um, one other quick thing, um, if you have an equation like this, if you had, um, I don't know, how about 7x squared plus, um, <laughs> I don't know, 9x equals 0. And if you're asked to solve, what's the first thing that you would do? We don't make a double bubble here. Do you see what we can take out? Do you see that we can take an x out of both of these? So I'm going to take an x out. Always start with your GCF. And then you're left with 7x plus 9 equals 0. Now you have a product equal to 0. One of your factors is x. One of your factors is 7x plus 9. Well, if we set 7x plus 9 equal to 0, we would subtract 9, divide by 7, and get negative 9 sevenths. What happens when you set x equal to 0? Don't we just get 0? So don't be afraid of um, factoring out a GCF and getting 0 as one of your possible solutions. Okay? All right. Hope you guys have a great day. Send me um, messages with questions. Have a great one.